Welcome to From His Heart, where Pastor Jeff Shreve is in an inspiring new series entitled Holy Boldness, Lessons from Elijah, the Prophet of Fire. In today's message, he'll share how to experience a miracle even when your brook runs dry. You have your Bible, please turn to 1 Samuel, or I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings 17. We want to talk today when your brook runs dry. William Carey was the missionary to India. He was born in 1761 in England. He became a Christian when he was in his later teens. And he had a desire in his heart to share Christ outside of the confines of England. And God led him to the land of India. We have a picture of William Carey just to give you an idea of what he looked like. He's famous for saying this. He's called the father of modern missions. But his famous saying was expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And that's how he lived. When he was getting ready to go to India, I mean, it was exciting. We are going to venture out and, and this is the gospel uh, from the, the continuation of, of Acts and we're going out and we're gonna share Christ in India. Well, his wife didn't wanna go. They had three boys, uh, four years old to eight years old and she was pregnant. And he said, well, we need to go. She said, I don't want to go. But he knew that they had to go. And and back in those days, I mean, the wife didn't have a lot of say. So she reluctantly went. They were on the ship for five months. She got seasick most of the time. She's big and pregnant and had her baby on the ship. When they got to India, Carrie hadn't calculated how expensive it was going to be for him to live And within two months, they ran out of money. They moved five times in seven months. Carrie got malaria, and his little son Peter got dysentery, and he got it so bad that he died. Seven months into the journey, he's burying his youngest son, Peter, and the strain was too much for his wife, and the depression turned into full-blown mental illness, and she was never the same. She never got out of the mental breakdown, nervous breakdown she had. She ended up living the end of her life secluded in a room, uh, restrained to a bed so she wouldn't hurt herself. Now, in the midst of all of this, William Carey, where he felt like God wanted him to be, burying his son, dealing with his wife and with no money. He said these words, this is indeed the valley of the shadow of death to me. Hey, can you relate to doing something that you feel like God wants you to do and running into tremendous opposition? I mean, it just seems like the bottom drops out It seems, as we're going to study today, like your brook runs dry, and you're scratching your head, and you can't figure it out, and it's like, why, God? Why is this so hard? I'm doing your will, and yet it seems like you don't want me to do it because there is such tremendous opposition. When God called me into the ministry, one of the things that I knew I needed to do was go to seminary. I didn't want to go to seminary. I thought, man, when, when I got graduated from UT in 1984, I was singing that song, School's Out for Summer, School's Out Forever. I thought I was done with school, and then God calls me in the ministry, and I talked to my pastor, and I said, God's called me in the ministry, and he said, a call to preach is a call to prepare. You need to go to seminary. 
I was like, ah, don't wanna do that. He said, you need to. And so Debbie and I talked about it, we prayed about it, and God led us to go to North Carolina. So I resigned my job. God called me in July of 1995 into the ministry. I resigned my job my, from my job in, at the end of May, and we went in June to North Carolina, Wake Forest, North Carolina, to go to seminary. And man, I was all excited. Hey, gang, we're going, and we're following God, and we're like Abraham. We're just going out there, and we know we're stepping out of the boat, and God is gonna do great and mighty things. And I get to seminary, and there are no opportunities for me to preach, no opportunities to teach. You know, I had this vision that everything, the, the heavens were just gonna open and people were gonna be so excited to meet Jeff Shreve and they're gonna want him to preach and, and pastor and, and uh, you know, pretty soon I'd be pastoring a church of, of you know, thousands and all that stuff. It was nothing. The only opportunities came to Debbie. People heard she could sing, they wanted her to sing. I was like, hey, we're here because of me, not because of her. <laughs> and man, I just felt like the brook had dried up. God, what's the deal? God, how come you're not coming through? God, I don't understand. Hey, what do you do when your brook runs dry? That's what happened to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. If you remember from last week, and if you weren't here, let me just catch you up to speed. Elijah is uh, somewhat of a mountain man from a little place called Tishbe on the other side of the Jordan River, and he has a heart for God, and God calls him to confront wicked king Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel, and they are turning Israel into a place of Baal worship. And Elijah, whose name means the Lord is my God, he comes and confronts uh, Ahab and says, there's not gonna be any rain. I stand before the Lord who is God. There's not gonna be any rain on the land except by my word. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. And God took Elijah after he confronted Ahab you know, Ahab is worshiping Baal. Baal is the God of fertility. Baal is the God of rain. And God goes right after their false God and says, I'm gonna show you who God is. And so after uh, Elijah confronts Ahab, then the Lord tells him, go to the brook Kirith, which is on the other side of the Jordan River, which is not that far from Tishbe, where he was from. And he says, go, the, go there, hide yourself there, and I will command the ravens to provide for you. And it says in verse six, and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he would drink from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Well, I mean, part of that is like, well, okay, that's, that's gonna happen because there's no rain and, and Elijah, that was, that was what you told him and so that's your prayer but now that's hitting you and your brook dried up. Hey, what do you do when your brook dries up? When you're where God wants you to be, but there's no water. I wanna give you a threefold action plan because all of us, if we live long enough and walk with God long enough, we're gonna find ourselves in a situation where the brook dries up. And then we ask ourselves, what do I do now? Threefold action plan for when your brook dries up. Part one, you remind yourself that God has not forgotten you. When the brook dries up, that's when the devil moves in. And the devil will whisper in your ear and say, ah, you're following God? You're serving God? You, you, you're going where God wants you to go? Well, look at this. There is no water for you. The brook has dried up. Maybe you misunderstood God. Maybe you didn't really understand what he uh, told you to do. Maybe you, you're in the wrong place because how are you going to survive if there is no water? The devil moves in when the brook dries up. That's what happened to me in seminary. When my brook dried up, the devil moved in, and I was, uh, all, all the excitement of uh, moving to North Carolina with no job, just stepping out on the word of God and taking uh, my wife and my three girls there and, and uh, trusting God, all that stuff, it started to, that, that started to fade. The vision uh, began to fade because there wasn't anything going on. 
And I was just disillusioned. I was like, God, why'd you bring me here? I mean, I'm not doing anything. I, I had a better ministry in Houston when I was working and providing for my family. And now uh, I just have part-time jobs and, and we're living on, uh, you know, less than a third of the income that I had before. And no, there's no health insurance because there's no money for that. And God, why'd you bring me here? I remember calling my pastor from Houston. And I said to him, I said, I'm really discouraged. And he said, well, tell me about it. So I told him, I said, there's just no opportunity here. I said, I don't know why I came here. He said, does any scripture come to mind? I said, the only one is Job 2, 9, curse God and die. And I said, that's not a good one. <laughs> it's not a good one. I was in that place where I thought God had forgotten about me. You ever been there? That's a lie from the devil. God doesn't forget you. That's why the very first thing you need to do when your brook dries up, you need to remind yourself, God hasn't forgotten me. Isaiah chapter 49, such a great passage where the scripture says this, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. Here's God's response to that. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. If you belong to Jesus Christ, he has engraved your name on the palms of his hands. He's inscribed you on the palms of his hands on his nail-scarred palms. He can't forget you. Hey, a woman wouldn't forget her nursing child, but even if she does, God says, that doesn't mean I will because you're right there, right there before me all the time. God hasn't forgotten you when the brook dries up. So you and I need to remind ourselves: God hasn't forgotten me and the Lord is in charge and he knows what he is doing. I don't know what he's doing. I don't understand, but God knows what he's doing and God is in charge and so I don't need to worry or fret or believe the lies of the devil. I love what William Carey said. I read you just the first part of his quote, but his whole quote was this. This is indeed the valley of the shadow of death to me, but I rejoice that I am here notwithstanding and God is here. It would have been very easy for William Carey in the death of his son and the, the, the situation with his wife and all the, all the uh, difficulties financially, it would have been so easy for him to say, I just think I missed the boat. I need to get back to England. This is awful place. But he knew that God called him there. He knew that God was there and he could still praise the Lord and trust the Lord. He stayed there for 41 years. He never had a furlough. 41 years of ministry, he translated the Bible into six different dialects and God used him in such a tremendous way. He's the father of modern missions. Hey, what do you do when your brook runs dry? Very first point of the threefold action plan, you remind yourself that God has not forgotten you. Secondly, you wait for God to show you the next step. So here's Elijah, Lord, I'm here. I'm at the brook Kirith, you told me to be here. And Lord, it's been awesome because the, the, the ravens, those dirty birds, those scavenger birds, they've been coming, they've been dropping food morning and evening and I've been drinking by the brook, but, but God, now the brook has dried up and, and Lord, unless the ravens start bringing uh, water jugs, I'm in trouble here. I can't make it here. So what do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do now? Well, let me tell you, when you are in that situation and your brook dries up, let me tell you the first thing you don't do. You don't take matters into your own hands and say, well, okay, I know how to solve this problem. I can't stay here. I'm gonna go to a place where I know I can find some water. Hey, uh, Lord, I'm gonna take the wheel now and we're going the way I want to go because the way you wanted to go is not working anymore. Don't do that. You're gonna be tempted to do that. I'm tempted to do that when the brook runs dry, but don't do that. Proverbs 3, 
5 and 6 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You wait for God to direct your path. You don't take matters into your own hands. You know who's the poster child for taking matters into his own hands when his brook went dry? Abraham. Abraham, who is known for his faith, he's the father of all who believe. Abraham, as the scripture says, he believed God and his faith was counted for righteousness. Abraham was in a situation in Genesis chapter 12 when his brook ran dry. I mean, he, he had left Ur of the Chaldees with his wife and with Lot, his nephew, and they had traveled to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And he's there where God wants him to be. But then it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, now there was a famine in the land. So Abram, he was Abram before he was Abraham, went down to Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was severe in the land. He hits the famine it's like the brook running dry. And he says, well, I, this isn't any good. I, I hear they have food in Egypt. And so I'm gonna just get myself down to Egypt and I'm gonna hang out there for a time. God didn't want him to go to Egypt. God never told him to go to Egypt. Egypt in the Bible is a picture of sin. And Abraham sinned when he went down into Egypt because if you know anything about the story in Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham went down to Egypt, one of the things he had to do was tell a lie. And he told his wife, now when we go see Pharaoh, you make sure to tell him you're my sister, not my wife, because you're a good looking woman and he's gonna take one look at you and he's gonna say, I want you for my harem. And if he knows I'm your husband, then he's gonna kill me. And so just say you're my sister so that it will go well with me. So he goes down to Egypt, he lies and deceives down in Egypt. It's a terrible thing that happened to him. He takes Lot, his nephew, down to Egypt, and Lot is polluted. Egypt is a picture of sin. Egypt is, is uh, not a good place, and so Lot goes down to Egypt, and Lot gets polluted by Egypt. And one of the reasons why we read in Genesis chapter 13 that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom is because he said it's like the land of Egypt. It's like the garden of the Lord, like the garden of Eden and like the land of Egypt. And I love Egypt and so I'm going in this direction. And he pitched his tent toward Sodom and that ruined his life. Came about because Abraham made a bad decision. Because Abraham took matters into his own hands. You know what else happened to Abraham in Egypt? He got a maid. Her name was Hagar. He took her out of Egypt. He's going to end up having sex with Hagar. His wife, Sarah, said, you need to do that and raise up a son because we don't have a son. And God said, he's going to give us a son. And so I think maybe God's wanting us to help him out with this plan. And so if you have a son with Hagar, she's my maid. So it'd be like it was in the family and it would be like my son. And God didn't want him to do that, but he did it. And he had a son and that son's name was Ishmael. And Ishmael became the father of the Arab race. And there have been problems between the Jews and the Arabs ever since. All because Abraham did not wait on God. He took matters into his own hands and it was a disaster. Hey, don't do that. Don't do what he did. Do what Elijah did. Stay put and stay attentive till God brings new orders. Hey, there, there's nothing going on here, Lord. The brook has dried up, and he waited until verse eight when the word of the Lord came to him saying, arise and go to Zarephath. He waited there. He stayed put, and he stayed attentive. His eyes were on the Lord, and he waited for God to give him instructions. Now, the scripture says this in Psalm 27. David said, I would have despaired unless I'd believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Well, we don't like to wait for the Lord. We don't like to wait for anything. We don't like to wait for our food. I mean, in today's world, everything instant, instant, instant. I mean, it's instant everything. And so we, we come to this instant, 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 instant. And you know what? We want instant God. 
We want instant answers to our prayers. We want God to be like a microwave. You know, you just, you put in your prayer and uh, you, you punch the button and you have about 30 seconds or 60 seconds of prayer and then bing, it's ready. Here's God with your answer. Let me tell you something about God. He doesn't use a microwave. He uses a crock pot. You found that out about God? Oh, well, how, why so long, oh Lord? How come it takes so long on this answer? Because God doesn't go by your time or my time. He goes by his time. His time. And when God chooses to move in his time, when he has everything ready, he moves quickly. You know, when we say, well, it's been so long since the Lord said he was going to come again. And it's been 2,000 years since Jesus died and rose again. And, and uh, where is the promise of his coming? When the Lord comes back, the scripture says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, it's that fast. It's quicker than a blink of the eye, just your eye to twinkle. That's when the Lord comes. And see, he, 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 in, from our perspective, he, comes, he moves slowly, but when God moves, it is rapid. And so we have to wait for the Lord. We stay put and we stay attentive until God brings new orders. Hey, the last thing that God told Elijah was go to the brook Kareth and I'll provide for you. I've commanded ravens to provide for you and you can drink at the brook. And so he had to stay there until there were new orders. And how did he stay there? I think he did what Jehoshaphat did when Jehoshaphat had the armies coming against him, three armies banded together and they were coming against him and they were uh, very close to Jerusalem. They were just outside in En Gedi, about uh, 20 miles or so away. And they said, what are you gonna do, King Jehoshaphat? He didn't know what to do. So he fasted and he prayed. And in his prayer, he said this, oh God, will you not judge them? He said, for we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. We're waiting on you to do something, God, and we're looking to you, we're attentive to you, and we're saying, God, we look to you until you shall be gracious. What do you do when your brook runs dry? Well, you remind yourself that God hasn't forgotten you. You wait for God to show up to show you the next step. And then thirdly, you obey the Lord even if it's hard and makes no sense. Even if it's hard and it makes no sense. Verse eight. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon and stay there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Zarephath, where's that? Zarephath is way up north. I'll give you a picture of Elijah's journey. He's at the brook Kareth, which is, you know, he's from Tishbe. So he's a little bit north of Tishbe when he was at the brook Kareth on the other side of the Jordan River. And he goes way up past the Sea of Galilee into uh, Phoenician land into the land of the Sidonians called Zarephath. It's right on the coast of the Mediterranean. You know, they worship Baal at Zarephath. You know who the king of that region is? A man named Ethbaal. He's Jezebel's daddy. He's the king of the Sidonians. And he says, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, so Ethbaal is in charge in there. Go there, I have a command, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now, Zarephath, it's like, God, why do you want me to go there? I don't wanna go there. Well, that's a long way, the Lord. You know, it's about an 85 mile journey to Zarephath. Lord, there are no believers there in Zarephath. I need to be making a difference with the, the Jews who are going south, but uh, talk to them about, I, about Jehovah God. You know, the Lord is my God. And I need to talk to them because they're the ones that are, uh, they're like me. And I go up way up north and there are a lot of people not like me there. And, and I'm a Jew and they're Gentiles. And I don't think that's gonna work very well. And God says, go. And he went. Now, I want you to think about Zarephath. 
because there's a Zarephath for you and a Zarephath for me. Zarephath is a necessary part of your spiritual growth. You know what the word Zarephath means? It means refinery. It comes from a root, which means to purge away, to melt, to refine. There was probably some kind of smelting furnace there in Zarephath. And that's why they named it that. But God is taking him there to purge him, to prepare him for his ministry that's gonna have huge implications in just the next chapter in 1 Kings chapter 18. But he can't stand on Mount Carmel against all the prophets of Baal until he spends some time in Zarephath for God to refine him for God to put him through the fire, so to speak. The scripture says in Malachi chapter three, and he will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. God is purifying Elijah at Zarephath. You know, when I went to seminary in North Carolina and left everything familiar to go there, that was Zarephath for Debbie and me. That was a place for us to be purified and refined, for God to skim off all the scum and the dross and the slag and, and, and junk in my life, the impurities. He would heat me up and start scraping those off. You know, when I told my pastor that all I could think of was Job 2, 9, curse God and die. He laughed, and I was obviously joking, but I was, there was a part of me that said, God, I don't understand this, and I don't like this. And you know, the Lord spoke to me during that time in those first six months, and he said, Jeff, if I want you here in North Carolina, not preaching, not teaching, not getting to do anything, just being a learner, don't you think that should be okay with you? I am in charge of this whole shebang. He said, will you just be soft clay in my hands and let me do what I want to do? And I said, yes, Lord. And as I've told you before, I learned in seminary a lesson that I have to go back to over and over and over and over and over again. And that the lesson is this, my only real job in life is to please God. That's my only job. Whether he wants me to be on the shelf for a while just learning or whether he wants me out front preaching or whatever he wants me to do, my job is just to be soft clay in the hands of the master and to please him. And the Lord taught me lessons in Zarephath in North Carolina, which was my Zarephath that I never would have learned anywhere else. God will take you there to teach you and to burn away the dross from your life. You know, in Elijah's life, he had to burn away the fear. He's going to Zarephath. Zarephath is where uh, Ethbaal is in charge. That's Jezebel's daddy. I don't wanna be anywhere around somebody that knows Jezebel that could tell Jezebel and Ahab where I am because Jezebel and Ahab wanna kill me. So he goes to Zarephath and God's gonna burn away the fear. He goes to Zarephath and uh, he is going to have a difficult journey in Zarephath. He's got to spend a long time in Zarephath. You got to remember something about Elijah. It's three and a half years before it rained. So God has hidden him at the brook Kirith for an unspecified amount of time. And then he's at Zarephath for an unspecified amount of time. But both of those times together equals three and a half years. And so maybe he was at the brook Kirith for a year. And then he's two and a half years in Zarephath. It's a long time. And the Lord is burning that stuff out of his life. He's burning off the ease and the comfort because he spends a long time in a Gentile land. And that's hard for a Jew to do that. It's hard uh, to get there because it's an 85 mile journey. For many of us, God needs to burn away this uh, strong desire we have for ease and comfort. Everything just easy, easy, easy. Christian life is not designed to be easy. And God has to burn that away, all that selfishness, and then burn away the pride. 
He's getting a widow. God says, I have a widow appointed and I've commanded her to provide for you. Now I can just imagine Elijah as he's making his way to Zarephath, he's thinking, you know, God's a good God. God's a big God. He does exceeding abundantly beyond all we ask or think. Uh, and he says, I wonder, that widow's probably wealthy. I mean, she's probably somebody that, uh, you know, can really provide for me. And it's going to be wonderful there in Zarephath because God is going to provide for me in a big way. Verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Well, I guess that's not the rich widow I was hoping for. I mean, she's got nothing. To quote Andy Bernard, she's got next to nerfing. I mean, just it's nothing there. And she's got a handful of flour and a little bit of oil, and she's getting ready to prepare the last supper, which is going to be meager, and then she's going to die. This is the person that God has put to be the one who's going to provide for me. God is going to burn out his pride so that he trusts in the Lord, and so he's a humble man of God. You know, it's interesting. It's in Zarephath where Elijah is called a man of God. He's called Elijah the Tishbite in 1 Kings 17.1, but in 1 Kings 17.24, when he raises this widow's son from the dead, the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. God made a man of God in Zarephath. And God wants to do that through your Zarephath too. It's a necessary part of your spiritual growth. And Zarephath teaches you that miracles happen when you obey. Hey, here's the lady that's to provide for me. She can't provide for herself. She's getting ready to eat and die of starvation. And so what does Elijah do? He said to her in verse 13, do not fear, go do as you have said but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be emptied until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. You know who this woman is, this widow? She's a picture of the New Testament widow who gave her two small copper coins and put those in the offering plate. It's all she had to live on. This woman, she takes all she had to live on and she said, okay, the man of God told me to, to bake him a cake first. Well, that doesn't make sense to me because we're starving to death. There's not much for me and my son, much less add another guy to the mix. But she gave him his cake first. And then just with the little that was left, she made something for her and her son. And the word of the Lord came true that says, your little handful of flour, that's going to last for two and a half years. Your little bit of oil is going to last for two and a half years. Do you remember when Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, the little kids lunch, and he fed the multitudes? That's a similar kind of miracle. She could have fed the whole town because that little handful of flour and that little bit of oil was never going to run out until God brought rain on the earth. And that was going to be in two and a half years or so. Hey, Zarephath teaches you that miracles happen when you obey. If she had said, no, I'm not gonna do that because that doesn't make sense, then she would have missed out. God would have provided for Elijah another boy, but she would have missed out. Listen, when you and I have the word of God and God makes it clear we are to do this, and we say, well, Lord, I don't think that that's right. I don't, I don't think that that's going to work that way. I don't, I don't want to do it that way. God says, I am God. 
If you want to see me work in your life, you have to obey me. In the Gospel of Luke, verse 17, there's a story told of the, the 10 lepers. Jesus sees these 10 lepers and they're standing at a distance because they're lepers and they can't come uh, near him. They can't come near anybody. Why? Because they're unclean, unclean. And they cry out from a distance and they say, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And Jesus says to them, go show yourselves to the priests. Well, you showed yourself to the priests if you were a leper, when you were cleansed of leprosy, you'd say, I'm cleansed of leprosy. I'm gonna go show myself to the priest. That's what they were supposed to do. But Jesus said to them, go show yourself to the priest. They say, well, we're lepers. Why don't you heal us, cleanse us from the leprosy, and then we'll go show yourself to ourselves to the priest. He said, no, go show yourself to the priest now. Well, we can't go now, Lord, because we have leprosy. Go show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says, as they were going, they were cleansed. God doesn't work until you first take a step of faith. Do you remember the old commercial, the forestry commercial? I can still remember it. Watching TV when I was a little kid, eight, nine years old, watching it, all of a sudden points his finger and says, only you can prevent forest fires. It's a lot of pressure to put on an eight-year-old. I'm in charge of all the forest fires. Only I can prevent forest fire. Listen. The Lord looks at you and he says, miracles start with you. They start with you obeying me. As Jesus said to Martha at the tomb of Lazarus, roll away the stone. Lord, we don't want to roll away the stone. He stinks. It's been four days. Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Roll away the stone. Jesus wasn't going to roll away the stone. God will not do what you can do, and you cannot do what he can do. And he's waiting on you to obey him. And when that woman obeyed him, bam, there was a miracle. And that miracle fed her for months and months and months and months and provided for Elijah. Hey, what do you do when your brook runs dry? You remind yourself that God hasn't forgotten you. You wait for God to show you the next step, And you obey the Lord, even if it's hard and even if it doesn't make sense. The song says this, trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. My friend, we've been talking about holy boldness, taking a stand for Jesus Christ. And listen, you can't do that until you know for certain you have a personal relationship with him, until you know for certain that you've been born again. Has that ever happened in your life? If not, it can today. Pray this prayer from your heart. Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner, I'm lost, and I can't save myself, but Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again on the third day. And Lord, right now, I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, change me from the inside out, make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you, Lord Jesus. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real-